Well, the slate, the slate, if I could read it, would say interview with uh, Jim Comstock and Will Foster, and we'll be going in in about 10 seconds. With me is Jim Comstock wearing the sling, and Dr. Will Foster, better than a professor of English. Rather than introduce these two gentlemen, I'd like you to each introduce each other. Uh, Dr. Foster, would you tell us who Jim Comstock is? Yes, I'd be very happy to. Uh, Jim has a double reputation. He's known uh, in the state as a journalist, which is a uh, newspaper, his county newspaper, which uh, has continued for many years. In addition to that, he has achieved a national reputation, and uh, since he has broken his arms, even an international reputation, <laughs> being known even in Zurich for his broken arms, uh, because of his extraordinary personalized weekly, which he spells W-E-A-K-L-Y, uh, called the Hillbilly. And I might say that he holds a degree as master of comstockery, uh, <laughs> the only degree of that nature in the world, and that he is a master of quips and quirks of human nature. Mm-hmm. Comstock. Yeah, and I did Comstock. Who is Will Foster now? You know, I'm, so, I'm so happy to meet myself. I'm <laughs> 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 hard to tell you who Will Foster is. <laughs> oh, he does. You know, the poetry doesn't worry me. <laughs> <laughs> and here, here is an authority on William Faulkner, mm-hmm. on um, Jesse Stewart, and now he's an authority on Jim Comstock, and he puts them all in three. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, how conglomerate can you get? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I just wonder how long have we known each other? I'd say uh, uh, 20 back. odd years. Right. So that goes really back before the founding yeah. of the West Virginia Hillbilly. Very, Hill very odd years. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Who were you before started? you started riding the West Virginia Hillbilly? I was, uh, let's see, I was editor of the uh, Smithless County Newsly. Mm-hmm. And before that, I was in the Navy. And before that, I was in the defense plant. Mm-hmm. I went in the defense plant to get out of the service, and then after I was there for a while, I went in the service to get out of the defense plant. <laughs> <laughs> and before that, I was a school teacher, and before that, I was a farm boy on Hinkle Mountain, and so that is just that's my the whole I say that, but I'm supposed to give your life. Yeah, that's the whole cycle. Yeah, that's the way it all <laughs> <ends up. laughs> How does somebody from Hinkle Mountain become a writer? You know, in, in my case, it was, it was very simple because I had a good teacher. About from the fifth to the seventh grade, I had an old gentleman who had taught my mother in Braxton County, a man by the name of George A. Long. And I swear I think he was the grandest teacher that ever was because of the simple fact that I was his only student, it seems to be, in a, cl- in a, in a one-room school of about 18 other students that he took a shine to me because, for some reason, he felt that I had journalistic tendencies. Now, he himself, I suppose, was a, a thwarted journalist. I mean, in that uh, crust of his was the heart of a man who wanted to write the daily happenings, like that, Addison Steele and so forth. And he would, his, his Bible was his grit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the, the something the people, a lot of people have never heard of the Pennsylvania Grit, but it's a mm-hmm. terrific paper. Well, he would bring that to school and then read it to us. And, and there's something wonderful about Grit. I've never lost the, the mm-hmm. desire for that. But he conceived the idea of having a newspaper. He couldn't have the newspaper he wanted. It was impossible back there in that day and time. So what he did was to assigned me to cover Hinkle Mountain News. I would write it up. He would type it on an old Oliver typewriter at home at night, and uh, he'd do it on eight and a half by 11 feet of paper. He'd clip them together, and we'd have about eight pages, and he would make eight copies with seven carbon copies. So you see the one that got the last one, <laughs> he got a pretty dim view of journalism. Not like television would compare to today. <laughs> <laughs> But you know, from then on, I suppose that that, that was born to me the desire to, to, be a to do those today. things, to write the happenings of other people and not care about being written about particularly, but mm-hmm. to write about people. Well, I wonder who stimulated you to add to your journalism uh, literature, since your own journalism is very rich in uh, references to the great writers, both American and British writers. Is there any particular teacher that... Uh, you know, I had a high school teacher, and she's living today in Bridgeport. Mm-hmm. And her name is Mrs. Oscar Andre. She's the wife of a lawyer. Her name was Ruby Cox. 
and she had a, a faculty for letting you have your own way. Oh, yes, that's all right. I mean, the thing is all right. Harold Bell writes is all right. There's nothing wrong with mm-hmm. it. But uh, you should try this with Balzac, or you should try the Maupassant. You know. And pretty soon, you know, I was beginning to think, uh, I show this the Maupassant almost as good as Zane Gray. And pretty soon I was beginning to think that they were better, and pretty soon I was moving into a thing. So when I got to college, instead of uh, uh, reading the uh, the mm-hmm. commonplace and so forth, I Being became literary. A, well, I became a reader of the New Yorker magazine, and, mm-hmm. I, and I believe that that is uh, one of the greatest uh, mm-hmm. exponents of literature in this country. Mm-hmm. If I were teaching school again, I believe that I, my textbook would be the, the New Yorker. I'd like to ask, Bill, if I may, just a question Yeah, here. I'm just slip one thing okay. in here. You say that your paper is published for the little old lady in Dubuque when uh, apparently the New Yorker specifically yeah, yeah, wasn't, and yet uh, that's sort of your Do you model. remember years ago when the New Yorker was going to sue me for stealing mm, their mail? I remember that. You know, mm. that, uh, you know they have uh, the, the, the picture of Eustace mm. Kelly there with mm-hmm. the skyscraper here and the wise old owl, you know, winking at civilization. Mm. So I kept the uh, uh, I kept used to Kelly, but I gave him a hard hat to represent the coal mining industry. I changed the uh, <laughs> Sodom and Gomorrah of Manhattan. I changed that to coal tipple because after all, that's what kept New York going anyhow. And uh, then, but I kept the cockeyed owl because after all, uh, mm-hmm. we too were wise enough to see the foibles of the human race. And so we came out one week with that. And the next week, we're ready to go to press with this purloin mask here. <laughs> when we got a letter, not from Mr. Roth, who runs the New Yorker magazine, but from three strange characters, Green Bomb, Wolf, and Ernst. <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty familiar name. <laughs> <laughs> Turned out to be the law firm. Mm-hmm. Uh, How did you react? Did you withdraw your... Oh, I was do right quickly. I apologize <laughs> right quickly. I restored you to, to, to Manhattan right away. I gave them their cockeyed owl, and I restored your skyline, and I said never again, because I didn't want to get mixed up with any Manhattan lawyer. But don't you think, though, that that's a, an example where the famous humorous magazine lacked a sense of humor? You know, that, that is one of the principles that I learned. It doesn't make a difference how funny you are, how humorous you are. You Still, when somebody's picking your pocket, it's something else. You might be a clown, you might be a super sales, you might be anything, but you're going to keep an eye on your agent. Because after mm-hmm. all, you've got to eat at Sardi's and you have to pay for it and you have to leave a nice tip. You have to live up to it. So as funny as you are, you lose your mm-hmm. sense of humor when you hit the practicality. Your interests are on the line, I suppose. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I suppose uh, Samuel mm-hmm. Johnson probably could maintain his because he didn't particularly care what he dressed like for... That's right. He didn't dress very well, as you know. <laughs> you remember the woman who, the woman who sat with him at the table and uh, at a dinner, and she, she said, uh, she said, Dr. Johnson, you smell. And he said, you know, madam, I'd like to correct you. He says, incidentally, you smell. I stink. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he never used it to the older <laughs> Now, well, is it unusual to find <laughs> literature blossoming in the mountains more than, let's say, music or the visual arts? It seems that uh, a writer has to be somewhat contemplative, and mountain people tend to be activists. They tend to be people who do things rather than sit around and say, how am I going to put this into words? I suppose the, the, the keynote to that one, uh, I'd say Rule probably knows that more than better than I do because he's really studied Appalachian literature. Yeah, I'm not going to aim that question at him. Yeah. But, but the trouble b- b- between Dr. Foster and myself is that, that I could never afford to call it literature. Now, he could <laughs> do that with his students, but if I ever used that with my group, yeah. remember the time that the, uh, the Saturday Review of Literature got a copy of my paper and... and uh, Oh, yeah, they were criticizing me for using a book review and letting the author review his own book. Remember Roger Price who came, who came I don't from remember that, no. Remember. Roger Price from Wyden, where mm-hmm. became quite a star in New York, a luminary in the field of literature. Mm-hmm. So he wrote a book, and it was a good book. And I said, sent him a copy. I said, how about reviewing this book for me? So he reviewed the book, and he said, incidentally, he says, I think all of your readers should buy a copy. And it's something they like. <laughs> well, the, the uh, Saturday Review took uh, exception to that. Uh, but, mm. but they said, incidentally, this paper, Hillbilly, from West Virginia, isn't what you think it is at all. It's, it's uh, sophisticated. 
And you demanded a retraction. Well, I wrote for a retraction. Yeah, you, <laughs> you, you couldn't have that said about your country <laughs> in West Virginia. You know, I had selling subscriptions. And so well, you, you can't do that. And in other words, if it's literary, you've got to slip up on them. Yeah. Now, right now, I have, um, uh, I'm torn with the idea that I would like to do a special issue on a man who came from Parkersburg. I call him the name of John Crawford. Very few people have heard about him. But he is one of the authorities on uh, William Morris, the, the mm -hmm. one of the greatest printers, I suppose, who ever lived, and, and type designers and, mm -hmm. and uh, bookmen. Mm -hmm. In fact, he has spent a fortune. He, his parents made a fortune in West Virginia, and he spent it on these books, and he recently gave it all to the Pierpont Library in New York. So I've got a hold of a lot of material. I'd like to do a special 16-page issue on John Crawford and mm -hmm. what he's done for William Morris. But, you know, I just can't feel myself to, to doing that because it is so far fetched yeah. the, on the, the type of, of readership that you would have. It's, it's, well, it's too much, really. It would be, uh, uh, yes, it would be a remarkable thing, and it would be good for the uh, posterity, but it would not do you much good for right. the contemporary well, media. Yeah. So when you're putting out your own newspaper, you can write pretty much what you want. You can within the realm of, uh, of limitations. What are your limitations? Well, uh, I, I don't try to write anything if it can't. Uh, for instance, a newspaper man's job, an editor, is to mutilate so much paper. Uh, 16 pages a week I mutilate with printer's ink and, mm -hmm. and, and adds uh, somewhat to the uh, ecological aspects of things. Uh, but one little part of it should be inspiring and lifting to within my realm. And uh, in, in that way, is, is I, ha I, have, I believe that I have a bit of a following. That, uh, for instance, to, to think that a, that a newspaper, a weekly paper, in this year, the, the, probably the greatest year that anybody could ever live in, the, the bicentennial, that I have finished up a 50-volume encyclopedia. I have finished up the acid test for it, which is a 200-page uh, history of West Virginia newspaper style telling the right. story of West Virginia page to page. Now, this sounds like colossal egotism of saying what I've done, but actually, the whole thing pr pretty much is the readers, yeah. because they, they have followed me like, there, for instance, the Pearl Buck House had to be purchased, somebody. Mm -hmm. It was turned down by two governors of West Virginia. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, I said, uh, after Pearl Buck wrote to me and she said, uh, I guess West Virginia isn't uh, ready for a thing like that yet. So I sent her a telegram and I said, the house is yours. And so I went to the people who had it for sale and I said, how much? And uh, they told me $30,000. I said, how much now? And they said, 3000 And I wrote them a check for $3,000, which was exactly the amount of money I didn't have in the bank. <laughs> but I wrote an editorial and you know that that was covered that particular week. Mm, so I didn't have a check for balance. Yeah. But I believe that people everywhere are looking for a joint leadership. I mean, it's not just one man. It's will you, and the cause was good, and they did it. And they met all of the, of the payments until the Women's Club of West Virginia sent the sure. delegation mm -hmm. around. So I say so much of it sounds, uh, they call it a Comstock paper, but actually it isn't that. Mm. I think we'd be interested in, uh, do you have other uh, crusades, as it were, which uh, you'd like to engage in in the future? The, these have been successful, for instance. You know, I'll have to take the fifth on that one, because <laughs> I think my wife could be listening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Dr. Foster, whether, um, where, where do you think journalism becomes literature? I think when it uh, produces something which is lasting, which I think this is true in Mark Twain's case. Mm -hmm. uh, journalism is normally thought of as something uh, as the today's newspaper uh, is of no value you know, mm -hmm. three days later. But when something is produced in a newspaper which does speak for a later generation, I think this is uh, why I'm interested in uh, Jim's editor on the go and his idea that he's a Sam Peeps of West Virginia. Uh, because he mm. records a... Sam Peeps was a 18th century... 17th century. 17th century, 17th century diarist. diarist. Uh, he wrote but he did not write to be read. No, he did not. He wrote That's in long hand or shorthand that people uh, they had quite mm. a double People had time uh, difficulty uh, finally deciphering it. But uh, what he wrote 
conveys to us the theme oh, of life in uh, 1660 in England know, better than anything else written. You know, I do so much of that for myself. I write for myself. For instance, remember when uh, Earl Butts made this unfortunate uh, boo-boo? Yes. All right? So many papers would not carry his exact words. Mm -hmm. Well, I suppose I'm the only weekly in the world that did it. Are you going to use them mm -hmm. now? I used them, but <laughs> no. nobody caught it because I wrote a poem uh, uh, in defense of Earl Butts, yeah. you see, of a man being, uh, that he should not be quoted. I mean, in this case, the, the, the thing was wrong with the Butts joke was that there was no reason in the world that it ever got out. It mm -hmm. was a private conversation. Sure. I've had that to happen to me with, uh, on various occasions. But I wrote a poem, and each poem started, and that was his entire... <laughs> say, a lot of people are going to go digging and into the back issues of the Hilda. No reader today, no reader yeah. has ever made that discovery. Oh, they'll well, find it. They'll Jim Comstock, we only got a couple of minutes left here, and uh, you're, I understand, trying to divest yourself of the hillbilly now, and there are so many people who say, Jim Comstock is the West Virginia hillbilly. How can you sell the paper out to someone else? What do you see as the, your future and the paper's future now? Well, very, very quickly, and as powerful as I seem to be, I cannot edit the paper from the hereafter. That is, whether I send it back mm. on You copy. can't edit the same paper from the hereafter. No, and so it has must be... Asbestos uh, copy? <laughs> Asbestos <laughs> copy, <laughs> or Celeste, uh, mm. the hammer mill bond. But it, uh, somebody has to take over. I have a young man now who thinks that he can do it with readership participation. He has to the first of the year, and if he makes the mm. go of it, then... He will have it. If not, then I have three or four other people who are waiting to buy so the paper. Like what you're saying but, is Pete Wallace has but, a month to raise a lot of money. Right. But I have a, um, um, a commitment that I will stay with the paper three or four years. I'll do the back page and edit it on the go, and then until it becomes Pete Wallace's paper. Will you still use the little logo which shows the... Uh, typewriter being loaded on the car. Oh, yeah, loads. yes. Uh, I, I don't well, know what Who designed Pete? that? Charles Harper. Mm -hmm. Is that right? And the bird artist, the little boy from the French crew. That's, mm -hmm. that's extraordinary. Yeah. Yeah. Is there some other writing? We've only got a few seconds left here. Some other writing that you like to do, like writing a novel or. You know what I'd story? like to do? I would like to do an editor on the go around the world. And that is what I'm going to do when I sell my paper. London. You're going to hear from me from Singapore. Or Another sort of innocence Alcatraz abroad. Or how do you see it? Everywhere. <laughs> uh, Jim Comstock, we uh, follow your writing so carefully around here. Thousands of West Virginians do, thousands of people around the country. And I've, I've enjoyed so much this opportunity to speak with you. Rule Foster, thank you for joining us. I'm glad finally we got together, and I hope the editor is also on the mend. Don't break your arms, Jim. <laughs>